Hi, Dr. Bob here to talk to you about sports photography. This is a talk I originally delivered at Fairview Hospital in October 2011, although I've made a few additions to it since then. And this topic, sports photography, is certainly my favorite type of photography as I've been a lifelong sports fan. It also is very technically demanding and requires a good equipment to get the very best results. So let's dive into sports photography. What you typically want in an image is something that looks like this. This particular image was taken by my friend Ted Schaub, who's got some very wonderful professional level camera equipment. Uh, the kind of images the publish in Sports Illustrated are images taken with equipment like this. Here's a picture I took recently of a young man trying to make an interception in the end zone. And these are fun pictures to shoot, although outdoor football at night is challenging because of low light. So you may want to get these kind of images, but what do you typically get? Well, you take your point-and-shoot camera to you know, a sporting event and shoot away, and you get images that look like this. If you can relate to this type of image, then this talk is for you. You'll notice that it's very blurry. It's very grainy looking. There's some motion artifact in the arm of the young lady who's going to spike the ball. Not a good image at all. So this talk is organized on 10 tips to get good sports photographs. Many of these are drawn from the books of Scott Kelby, who's kind of my digital photography hero. He's a professional that has published this series uh, called the Digital Photography Books 1, 2, and 3. He deals with chapters on sports in volumes 1 and 3, and I highly recommend them. They are excellent. So what are our tips for getting better sports photographs? Well, tip number one is to use a fast shutter speed or a short exposure time. Why is this important? Well, in order to freeze the action. Now, how fast do you have to go? How about a 50th of a second? That doesn't sound very long, but if your shutter is open for a 50th of a second and there's action going on on a court, what you see here is quite a bit of blurring of the players, their arms, the ball. Not good at all. You need to go faster than a 50th of a second to get good image quality. How about a 160th of a second? Well, notice the bat here is blurred. That's because in that 160th of a second, the bat is moving, and so it comes across blurred when the shutter is open for that long. How about a 200th of a second? Well, this isn't bad for wrestling, although you'll notice the wrestler in red has some blurriness in his right leg and foot. That's because they are moving as the shutter was open for that 200th of a second. And you'll find for different sports, different shutter speed requirements are necessary. Anything with a moving ball typically requires faster shutter speeds to freeze the action. Here's my daughter playing tennis, and you'll see a motion artifact of the ball that looks like a long oval there, even though you know that it's spherical and her racket is not in good focus either. That's because there's movement of it during that 250th of a second. How about a 320th of a second? Well, we're getting better, but you notice that the basketball player's hand and basketball are blurred. They're moving. 400th of a second? Well, there's less artifact, but you'll see the tennis ball in the left photo is still oblong. And in the right photo, the ball is frozen on a serve, but the racket is moving. Gives you a blur. How about a 500th of a second? Well, we're uh, getting better. That soccer ball is almost frozen. 640th of a second? Might be good for a lot of sports, but not good for golf. See that ball is moving very fast, well over 100 miles an hour as it comes off the club face. Uh, Scott Kelby does recommend for sports, though, a default setting of a 1 640th of a second. For most sports, that gives you good frozen images. Here's baseball at an 800th of a second. You see a little motion artifact of the ball. Here's a 1,000th of a second, and we're finally in the range 
that I like to shoot in. I like a thousandth of a second to really freeze the action on this opening tip-off of a basketball game or with a young lady setting in volleyball. You can go faster than that if you have good light. Outdoor baseball is pretty easy. Play during the day often. You have sunlight. Here's a 1250th of a second. You see that ball looks nice and spherical right on that bat as the little girl prepares to bunt. Here's a 2,000th of a second, one of my friend Ted's photographs. And all the photographs in this talk are taken either by myself, my friend Ted, or two other friends named Lee Atkins or Steve Jacobs. This is one of Ted's shots. Beautiful picture. Here's a 2,500th of a second in what we call the famous phantom tag, where my son is trying to tag a guy coming into third base. He missed him, but the umpire missed the call and called the runner out. That's a 2500th of a second. Look at the dirt coming up from the runner's foot. Everything's frozen. So ideally you want a 640th of a second or faster. How do you accomplish this? Well, you can shoot manually, you can shoot shutter priority, or you shoot in sports scene. And that will look different depending on what type of camera you have, what level it is, but for uh, most digital SLRs, you'll have a dial something like this. For a point and shoot, you may at least have a sports scene mode. Manual is what I like to shoot in. That's M here on the Nikon on the left, M for Canon on the right. If you shoot shutter priority, that's a shooting mode in which you determine exactly what your shutter speed is and have the camera do the rest, pick the proper aperture to go with it. And that's talked about in more detail in the advanced exposure talk. Nikon calls it S, Canon calls it TV, with T standing for time. And then there's a sports scene shows a little runner on both of these cameras. So the least you ought to do is go to sports scene. Shutter priority is better. Manual is the best if you know exactly what you're doing with your camera. Now are there any exceptions to this? Well, yeah, there are, and it has to do with the photographic depiction of motion, basically. If you want to show motion in a photograph, you may want intentional blurring. Well, what do I mean? Well, here's a gentleman named Lee who took some photos that are in this presentation, but Lee's also a very avid and good cyclist. Here's an image I took of him riding down a sidewalk. Now, is he moving? Or is he totally stationary, just balancing himself on the bike? You can't tell from this picture. So uh, even though I have frozen everything, a thousandth of a second here may not be what I want because it doesn't give you any sensation of motion. So how might I get some motion in this image? Well, I could put my camera on a tripod and take the exposure time to, say, a fortieth of a second. What would that do? Well, if I'm shooting straight ahead and Lee's going through the shot, I'd get something like this. So he just looks like a ghost heading across the image. That's not a very appealing image either, although you do get the sense he's moving. Well, how about another technique? How about if I put my camera on a tripod, but then I actually move the camera along with the subject as I shoot? That's a technique called panning, P-A-N-N-I-N-G, panning. And here's my first panned image, where I'm moving the camera along with Lee. You'll see there's a little bit of motion depicted in the spokes of the wheels there. You'll see Lee's in good focus, but the background now is becoming out of focus, because I've moved my camera along with Lee. So during that one hundredth of a second that the shutter is open, the camera has actually moved along with the subject causing the background to blur out a little bit. Now that's a good first start, but it still doesn't give you a sense of a lot of motion. My favorite image of this little photo shoot that we did is this one. This is at a thirtieth of a second. I'm panning along with the subject. You'll see Lee's head and arms and torso are in good focus. His legs are not in good focus, but why not? Well, that's because he's pedaling. He's moving. And you'll see the spokes give the sensation of spinning, and you see the background is totally blurred out. So here you get the sense that he's whizzing along down the street, and that's indeed what I want. So there are times 
where you want a longer exposure time, but for most sports we do want to freeze the action. Tip number two, you want to use a wide open aperture for sports. Your aperture setting, and I would refer you to the exposure basics talk, but your aperture setting has to do with the actual opening through which light travels to get to the sensor. It can be wide open as on the left, or it can be pinpoint as on the right. This is what's called on your camera your f-stop. It's a reciprocal number, so if you look over on the right end of this bottom image, you'll see 22 there in blue. That's a fairly pinpoint aperture. Let's very little light through, but everything tends to be in good focus. And since it's reciprocal, 1 over 22 is a small number. If I go to the other end, I have 1.4. That's a wide open aperture. 1 over 1.4 is a much bigger number than 1 over 22. What does a wide open aperture do for you? Well, it lets you get a lot of light in there in a hurry. But it also takes your depth of field way, way down. What do I mean by that? Suppose we've got a camera on the right end here and we're shooting at seven teddy bears focusing on the one in the center. Well, if you had a wide open aperture, you focus on the guy in the center, he's in focus, but all the teddy bears in front or behind him are out of focus. So a very narrow depth of field. As you go to higher aperture numbers, from 4 up to 8 to 16, those are smaller actual apertures. Remember, it's a reciprocal. So if I'm shooting at f16, I get the center teddy bear in focus, but also the ones in front and the ones behind are all in focus. And that's a wonderful thing for nature photography, where you want your foreground, your midground, and your background all to be in focus. But it's not so hot for sports. It takes a lot of light to get in and saturate the sensor, and you don't have that luxury if you're shooting at a 640th of a second or a thousandth of a second. And this comes down to some of the lenses that you might use with your digital SLR. Here's a typical camera. This may be a D90, I'm not sure, but it's got a lens that was a good multi-purpose lens, 18 to 200 millimeters. That covers a pretty broad range from wide angle to pretty good telephoto. But you'll see on the lens it has a 1 colon 3.5-5.6. What in the world does that mean? Well, what it means is that at 18 millimeter focal length, that's when you're as wide angle as you can get, your minimum aperture number, in other words, your most open aperture, has an f of 3.5. When you're zoomed out all the way, like you might be with sports, 200 millimeters, there your most open aperture is 5.6. 5.6 is an intermediate aperture. It is not very open. And so this type of lens will limit you when you're trying to shoot sports, especially indoor sports. A better lens would be something like this. This is a 70 to 200 millimeter lens made by Nikon. And it lets you shoot at an aperture that is open at f of 2.8 throughout the entire range from 70 all the way out to 200 millimeters giving you the ability to get a lot more light in and to have a shallower depth of field and more pleasing images. Now it's no surprise that this lens on the right is much more expensive than the lens on the left. The lens on the left probably five or six hundred dollars, the one on the right is two thousand to twenty five hundred. So you get into some expenses when you want to shoot sports with good equipment. What does an open aperture do for you? Well, again, it gives you a fairly narrow depth of field, a shallow depth. Here, the young man passing my son the basketball is in focus, but my son is very much out of focus. Here are a couple images. On the left is my daughter serving a volleyball. You'll notice that the fans in the background are totally out of focus, and this is a nice effect. You want your eye to go to the portion of the image that is in focus and not to the portion that's out of focus. Similarly, one of Ted Schaub's photos on the right of a guy catching a pass. Beautiful image as he's hauling it in. He's in perfect focus as is the football, but you'll notice that the people in the stands are totally blurred out. And this is the type of picture you'd see in Sports Illustrated with a very wide open aperture. Here's a shot that Steve Jacobs and I took 
the timing was good. We used continuous shooting and got this young man being plunked by a pitch ball as the baseball is right in his armpit. But you'll notice that he's not separated out from the background. At an f of 4.5, the fence is in focus, the people sitting in the stands are in focus, and so it's not as good an image. It doesn't draw the attention of your eye to the batter as well as it would if the background were blurred out. Now your f-stop, you can go to higher numbers if you're zoomed in to a high level. Here are the image on the left, 340 millimeters. That's a very big zoom. And an f of 4.8 still separates out my daughter, who's got her game face on, uh, from the background where that fence is uh, very out of focus. When she's pitching here, you'll see she's in focus, the ball's in focus, but the trees in the background are out of focus. This is the effect that you want. Similarly, little girl handle on the baseball at first base, background way out of focus. Now there is an exception to tip number two as well, and that is if you need a certain depth of field. Say, for example, you're shooting team photos. Here's my daughter's softball team, and I probably should have offset the heads a little bit better rather than done the totem pole look, as the professional photographer corrected me. But you'll see that all three rows, at least here, are in focus because I'm out to an F of 6.3. If I were at 2.8, I might get the center row in focus, but the coaches in the background and the players in the front row might be out of focus. That's not what I would want. Similarly for this, I need the trophies in both rows in focus. Or here where my son played in the state golf tournament, I wanted the whole team to be in focus, but also the Ohio State University sign to be in focus for this shot. So if you need a greater depth of field, then you need to go to a smaller aperture, which would be a higher number, in this case an f7.1. Sports photography tip number three has to do with the ISO. And we covered this in Exposure Basics, but let me do a brief review. The three main determinants of your exposure, given any specific degree of ambient light, are as follows. You have your shutter speed, if you have a very short exposure time, like a thousandth of a second, it's pretty dark. If you go out to a half a second, you may be very, very bright. And so you have different gradations in between. Your aperture we've just mentioned, if your aperture is a pinpoint, like an f of 22, you don't get much light in. You have to have the shutter open for a long time to get much light in. On the other hand, if you have an open aperture, way down on the right end, f of 2.8 or f of 1.4, you get a lot of light in the camera in a hurry. So that's determinant number two of exposure. And then the third determinant is ISO. And that has to do with the sensitivity that your sensor is set at. It used to be that you'd buy film that was 100, 200, 400. If you were shooting indoor basketball, you might buy 800 or 1600 ISO film, but it was very, very grainy. And that's the downside of shooting at higher ISOs. I mean, an ISO of 3200 or 6400 is very sensitive to light, so it will let you get the image you want at a fast shutter speed, but it tends to have digital noise. So you prefer to shoot on the lower end, 100, 200, 400 ISO. You get much better quality images that way. The higher the ISO, the more digital noise, which is analogous to grain when you do film processing. So an ISO of 200, pretty clean here in white, gray, and black. But as I go up, you'll see when I get up to an ISO of 6400, you get this very grainy looking image with a speckled pattern to it. That's called digital noise, and that's not what you want. Ideally, I like to shoot 100 to 800. I can't always attain that ideal, but that's my goal. Problem when you shoot higher is you get images such as this. Here the ISO was 1800, and you'll notice this speckled pattern over my son's face. He's got the basketball. Even on the wall in the background, it just looks like it's almost uh, painted with little dots. It's just not a very nice image. Now I can use some software, one program by ImageNomic called Noiseware, can clean up the image a little bit and take away some of that noise and get an image like this. So it's better. But it's still not very good. You'll see that Xavier, 
player number 33 is in much better focus than my son, so I didn't get my focus proper in this image. To delve into this a little further, let me contrast these two images. These were taken at a recent hockey game from the same general vantage point. Steve Jacobs was about five feet to my left, and we both took these shots and happened to catch these two less than a half second apart. Steve was shooting with a Nikon D60, which has a CCD charge coupled device sensor. And I was shooting with a Nikon D300, which has the more expensive but better CMOS uh, sensor, standing for complementary metal oxide semiconductor sensor. There are several differences in the images, although they superficially appear to be pretty much the same. We were shooting at similar focal length. Steve was at 72 and I was at 85. So that's a negligible difference. But notice that he was shooting at 160th of a second and I was shooting at a thousandth of a second. At 160th of a second you'll see that of the three players there, two of them have sticks that are very blurred. Whereas on the image on the right they're pretty well frozen. Another difference has to do with the f-stop. Steve was shooting at an f of 5.0. That gives him a greater depth of field, but that may not be what you want on this type of image. I was shooting at an f of 1.6 using my 85 millimeter prime lens, which goes down to 1.4. And you'll see that on the image on the right, the players are all in good focus, but look at the guys in the background, particularly the guy standing there in the orange shirt you'll notice that he's much more out of focus in the picture on the right as opposed to the one on the left. And then finally, he was shooting at an ISO of 1600, and I was shooting at an ISO of 800, and that makes a big difference. It may not be obvious looking at it on these two images, but let me do a zoom in and show you the difference between ISO of 1600 and ISO of 800. Here's the ISO 1600 image. Look at the player's helmet and his jersey. Very splotchy looking. Whereas on the right, much cleaner on the helmet and the jersey. Much better image quality. So when you shoot at a lower ISO, you don't get that digital noise. You get better image quality. Ideally, your ISO should be 100 to 800. I also use a feature on my camera called Auto ISO, which is a very useful option if you have it. With my particular camera, I can set a range here, in this case between 400 on the low end, 3200 on the high end. And how does this work? Well, it basically lets me use a manual shooting mode, and I pick my shutter speed, say a 640th of a second. I pick my aperture, as open as my lens will go, 2.8, and then I let the camera decide what ISO it needs to use to get a reasonable exposure. I actually sometimes purposely underexpose these by 0 0.3, 0 0.7, or one stop so that I don't push the ISO too high and then I brighten them up later. But that's a suggestion for you technophiles. This mode is very nice though because it lets me shoot at lower ISO levels when I've got enough light and when I don't the camera pushes the ISO up. I sacrifice image quality and get some digital noise, but I still have the shutter speed and aperture that I want. So it's a wonderful shooting mode for sports. A higher ISO may be necessary if you're going to keep these fast shutter speeds where you're not letting a lot of light in quickly. I figure that having some of that digital noise sure beats having blurriness in your photo. Some of the higher end digital single lens reflex cameras will have high ISO noise reduction algorithms built into them. Here's the Nikon D300, which has this specific feature where you can set the camera to reduce the amount of noise that it sees, and it really makes the image a lot prettier. Tip number four, we want to use the continuous shooting mode. And why is this important? Well, how do you get an image like this? Here's my little girl playing softball. Pitch comes in. She swings the bat. I've got the picture of the bat contacting the ball. That's exquisite timing. That's either tremendous good luck or I used a bunch of shots to get this one. I was shooting away boom 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 to get this image and that's how it's done. 
Similarly, you want to get the kid blocking the shot. Well, you've shot maybe five images right before this and five images after it, and this happens to be the good one. If you see in Sports Illustrated, the guys who get the perfect picture of the linebacker jumping up and getting his hand on the winning field goal kick, and they have a picture of the ball touching his hand, well, those kind of images are only obtained, really, from shooting multiple shots in a hurry, and you happen to catch the one that you want. So how do you do that? Well, virtually all cameras, even point and shoots now, will have some type of continuous shooting mode. And my Nikon, that S over in the bottom left, is not what I want to do. That stands for single shot. I mean, that's fine for taking a team picture, but when I want to shoot action, I want lots of pictures in a row. On my particular camera, three frames per second is considered low speed. And I can actually adjust that to different numbers. But a lot of cameras, that might be the max you could get, would be three frames per second. It's better than nothing, but it's still hard to get the bat on the ball type of images. As you go up in cost on cameras, you typically get more frames per second for mainly sports photography is the main utilization of that feature. Here I'm showing Nikon and Canon series. And if you start with about three frames a second, you're maybe $600, $700 for these cameras, but as you move up, say the D300S for Nikon gives you about 8 frames a second, at least with a battery grip added onto it, and we're up to almost $2,000. When you go to full frame, you drop off a little bit, but full frame cameras give you the very best image quality. You go to a Nikon D3S, which is my dream camera, I get up to 10 frames a second, but that camera lists for around $5,000. I think Canon has one that will now go to 12 to 14 frames per second, so it can be pretty impressive uh, what you get. Here's my high speed shooting, 8 frames per second. And that will let you get sequences of uh, images. Here's my son shooting a three pointer against Canton Timpkin, and I cropped this down a little bit, uh, but you'll see the ball in the air going through and so you might want to pick one of those that you like. Or here he was playing in the state golf tournament. Now when you hit a putt it takes several seconds for the golf ball to get to the hole. Golf is not a fast action sport except at uh, impact on a full shot. So you might want to go one or two frames per second to get a putt going down. This is basically one frame per second. It took about five seconds. Look at that white car in the background as the ball sitting on the edge, and by the time it drops in, it's to the end of the frame. Now I can shoot faster if I want to get an image of, say, a pitcher and get his form. Here's a 12-shot sequence all done in a second and a half, eight frames per second. You go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think I like image 10 the best, but that's how you might want to shoot to get the exact shot that you want. And my friend Ted likes to play with Photoshop more than I do, and sometimes we'll take an image like this with an uncluttered background and superimpose the picture and get a composite image, something like this. So a very nice creative composition there by Ted. Sports photography tip number five. You want to use continuous and dynamic autofocus. And this is getting a little bit more technical, but let me see if I can make sense out of it. On my Nikon camera, I have three choices for the way I'm going to autofocus. I have an M or manual, that's where autofocus is totally off. There's a single, autofocus single, where when you press the shutter button down halfway, it freezes your focus. It focuses on your desired object and then it freezes that focus until you complete your shutter press. And that's nice for shooting a family portrait, but if you've got a guy running across your screen or running towards you, by the time you actually shoot the shot, he's going to be out of focus again because he's closer to you than he was when you pressed halfway down. So here's what you typically want to use for sports, is autofocus continuous. And that means the autofocus remains active 
and changing right up until the actual moment of exposure when the mirror flops up and you take the shot but you're always auto focusing right up until that moment and that's how you're going to get your best images for sports so that's the continuous portion of autofocus how about the dynamic portion well this is a little complicated as well but you may see on the back of your camera a little switch that looks something like this for autofocus sensor modes and for my camera it's got what's called auto area dynamic area and single point single points the easiest to understand so suppose that you set right in the middle of your camera a single point and whatever is in that point comes into focus for example this hockey player and I've set a little red square there right in the middle of the photograph or just one notch off of the center that is the location where the camera is going to autofocus if you have a very steady hand or if you're lucky you may get that single point on your subject but it's difficult as your subject is moving and you're trying to track him or her with the camera you may frequently have that little red dot be somewhere totally other than the player maybe on the back wall which would then come into focus and the player is totally out of focus so this can lead to problems now, in this case the player was in focus and I got that shot so that was good but there are other times where you get in trouble for example look at this shot my daughter's bumping a volleyball but whoops she's way out of focus the girl on the other court is the one in focus and this happens all the time when you're shooting sports you get the wrong subject in focus and it creates for some challenges when you're shooting sports here's a picture taken by Steve Jacobs he was trying to get a play at third as his son was playing third base but what happened here well the third baseman and the runner are way out of focus but look at the uh, guy in the on deck circle way in the background he's in perfect focus so here we've got the wrong subject in focus now fortunately as his play developed he moved the camera onto the runner and got this shot as he was tagged out getting in the third base so he redeemed himself with uh, correction of the autofocus blunder so this dynamic autofocus well how does it work well you may with your camera have nine points eleven points twenty one thirty nine fifty one points in your kind of central zone of your camera you may have a lot of sensitive points that can all be used for autofocus here's an example of a picture of my daughter hitting a volleyball and look at all the little red squares in that central kind of oblong section of this photograph mine actually has 51 points and it picked her as being the subject not the coach in the background there and so she came out in nice focus in this photograph with the background being blurred out similarly here was a shot now it had four little red squares in the center one on the coach's shoulder but it decided to put my little girl in focus as she's practicing her setting you'll notice the balls in the foreground are not in that central area so they didn't equate into this dynamic autofocus calculation and here's the way the shot came out with the balls in the basket totally out of focus with a wide open aperture of 1.4 here's one final example of some action at the net in a volleyball scrimmage you see two little red squares kind of hitting the net and maybe the leg of the player with the pink shirt but that's about the right level for the focus and you'll see that she's in focus the balls in focus came out pretty good the pole in the background that white pole in the distance however is out of focus and that's fine this is what we want so continuous dynamic autofocus is what you ideally want for sports photographs now there are some exceptions to this and sometimes I will use manual focus to overcome some of these problems you may encounter with autofocus in other words I may pre-focus on a specific area I often do this when shooting baseball and I know a batter is at home plate and I want to shoot the swing well I use autofocus to get them in focus and then I switch over to manual so that the camera 
as I take multiple exposures of the batter swinging, the camera doesn't have to worry about autofocus in between each shot. And I can get more frames per second that way, as a matter of fact. So how does this work? Well, here's an example. I anticipated a play at third base. I'm kind of zoomed in. I pre-focused on that area right in front of third. And then as the play developed and the runner's coming in, I'm shooting totally manual focus. But since I knew that spot was in focus, as the player came into the spot, he's totally in focus as he gets tagged out flying into third. I'm using a fast shutter speed, 15 hundredth of a second. The dirt is flying, totally frozen. You'll see the look of disgust as the runner knows that he's out. Bummer. So that's an example of what's called zone focus, where you pre-focus. Some wedding photographers like to do this as well, so they don't miss the important shot as the bride comes down the aisle. They'll pre-focus on a pew number seven, and then as the bride hits that uh, area, they're already in manual focus and just fire, and they'll know they get the shot. Sports photography tip number six is to shoot in JPEG format. Now for a purist, you may want to shoot in RAW, but I like JPEG. In fact, I shoot JPEG fine in the large image size. This usually allows for more frames per second than if you shoot in RAW, although I would refer you to the image file formats talk for more details on this. One potential problem shooting JPEG is that you need to make sure you get a good white balance. You're setting that up before you shoot and if you have the wrong white balance you may get a very yellowish or a very bluish tinge to all your photographs and they can be difficult to correct. So there are ways to set this up if you're shooting outdoors you should do direct sunlight. If you're shooting indoors it can be a challenge. There are a variety of uh, ways to correct for white balance that you can talk to your local uh, camera store employee about. One I like to use is called the Lally, L-L-L-Y, the Lally cap. You can use uh, neutral gray cards to set your white balance. Or kind of a fun way to do it is to uh, set your camera to live view if you have it and then look at your LCD screen and then start changing your white balance while you're in live view and just change it until what you're seeing on your LCD screen matches what your eyes see with the actual surroundings, the people on the far side of the gym or whatever. Shooting indoors can be a real challenge because of mercury vapor lights, different types of fluorescent lighting. Often the white balance setting there is down at fluorescent which is maybe around 3000 K and for that I'd refer you to the white balance talk for more details. So I like to shoot JPEG but I always want to make sure I get good white balance set beforehand. Tip number seven, shoot from good shooting locations. Well where's a good shooting location? Well you don't want to shoot into the sun. You typically get some artifacts, some lens flare when you shoot that way. So not ideal. You want the sun to be behind you or at least off to the side. Ideally you want a background that's not cluttered rather than have a bunch of players or fans right behind the image. You'd rather have you know, blue sky and trees in the background. Shooting from a low position, in other words at player level, is preferable and certainly NFL Films knows this as all their shots are from field level. But you want to move around. Don't just pick one spot to shoot your basketball game. Move around. Go to center court. Go to one end. Go to the other. Maybe go up in the stands. Just get some different shots. Here's an image I took shooting from the far end of this gymnasium at ground level. You'll notice the gentleman in the bottom left of this, not the player, but the guy with the camera, he's a professional photographer. They're shooting for the Akron Beacon Journal. And you'll notice that he's right there at court level, right on the end line. That's a great spot to shoot from if they'll let you in there to do it. Sometimes you'll get booted out though when you try. This is a gym at a school called Triway down in Worcester, Ohio. And you couldn't get down at ground level. The gym was actually kind of cut down into the ground and so the stands were up about 10 feet and higher. So the best I could do 
was to shoot from a high vantage point kind of down at the action, which was a different vantage point made for some interesting photos such as this one where Xavier is throwing in an acrobatic layup. But uh, generally you like to shoot at ground level. Then if you're taking a lot of shots or going to be shooting for a long time, it's always nice to have a monopod for stability and to support heavy lenses. Occasionally I'll use a tripod. Here's my friend Steve Jacobs shooting from a tripod, catching the batters at home plate, but a lot of sporting events won't let you in with a tripod. In fact, we got booted to the out of play section since we were actually in play with that tripod. So better is to use a monopod. You can get it out of the way in a hurry. You'll see these all over the place at NFL games, guys on the sidelines, because you can move them away quickly. They support the weight of the camera and the lens, and some of these big lenses are very heavy, and also give you a little extra measure of stability so that your image is less blurred, although when you're shooting at high shutter speeds like we're trying to do, that's not as much of an issue. Sports photography tip number eight. You want to frame your subject for best effect. And this comes down to composition of your photograph, composition basics. You may want to refer to that talk. Ideally, you want to get close to your subject. And that's why it's important to have a telephoto lens that goes out to 200 millimeters or beyond so you can get in tight. Here's a shot I took with a 200 millimeter lens, but I was so far away that this is the exposure that I got of my son getting out of a sand trap on the Scarlet course at Ohio State. And he indeed got up and down for those golfers watching this video. Now you'll notice the guy in the background who is one of the officials riding a cart is sitting there eating lunch. He doesn't really add much to this photograph. So ideally getting in tight and getting a shot like this would be better. So get in tight to your subject. I had to crop this one down so I lost some image fidelity in the process. In terms of the orientation of your photos, it turns out some sports are better shot vertically especially those where the ball is up in the air like basketball and volleyball. Others are best shot horizontally. Maybe baseball or hockey or football are a better shot that way. But as a general rule, solo subjects, since people are taller than they are wide, it's nice to shoot them vertically. For group shots and conflicts out on the field, uh, usually a horizontal landscape orientation is better. Here are some examples of vertical shots. My son grabbing a rebound and my little girl serving a volleyball. Nice vertical shots isolating the subjects there. Here's a conflict shot that was taken by my friend Lee, who was the cyclist that you saw earlier. And this is a nice photograph of a little collision out on the ice. This is shot obviously horizontally and has a nice effect. Here's another one taken by Ted. Beautiful shot of a guy in flight over a soccer ball. In terms of framing the subject, if you're shooting a sport that includes balls, it's always nice to show the ball so that you get some context for what's going on. It's not always essential, but it's nice to show the ball if you can. Here's an image Lee took with my camera of Greg Norman getting out of a sand trap. You see the ball right in the center. And this composition also kind of fits the rule of thirds with the flag being a third of the way across and Greg Norman being two-thirds of the way across. So that's kind of a nice picture on practice day at Canterbury Golf Club in Cleveland a few years ago. Another recommendation is to leave room in your frame ahead of a moving athlete. For example, if a young man like my son here is dribbling the ball down the court, here I've boxed him in. He's got no room to go in this photograph. And it kind of stifles him. It's not a good composition. A much better one is this, from which actually the first image was cropped, but it shows he's got some open court ahead of him, a guy trailing on the left side, and leaving room ahead of a guy, whether he's running or bicycling or whatever, you always want to leave some open area in your composition rather than boxing him in. Tip number nine has to do with knowing your sport. You want to anticipate the action so that you can get the shot that you want. And the better you know your sport, the better you know where the action is going to be. In basketball, for example, most of the action occurs 
from the free throw line and in, so that's where you're going to get your best shots. If a kid goes up for a jump shot, you may want to try to anticipate that and time it so that you get the shot right as it's coming off his hand where the ball is fairly stationary. That may allow you to go to a longer shutter speed of a 250th of a second, for example. Here I was shooting baseball. My son threw the ball to the third baseman. And they've got the runner here. This is at a 2,000th of a second. But I was just on the other side of the fence. Uh, beyond third base expecting a play here so I was ready when it came and Brian put on the tag and that runner is out by a mile so anticipating the action is key here this defender was overplaying my son to the right and he likes the old behind the back so I anticipated that and got this shot here's a picture by Steve Jacobs who expected a play at third base his son Ryan is playing third Puts a tag on the guy, and notice the umpire looking intently at the action, and calls him out. And this brings into play the final tip, and that has to do with capturing the emotions of players, and umpires and cheerleaders for that matter. Here's a nice shot of uh, guys fighting for a rebound. I'm not showing the ball here, so I break that rule. But this is actually a, a good place to shoot in basketball is when guys line up on a free throw as the ball goes up and touches the rim they jockey for position and lead to some good pictures. In sports with helmets like this lacrosse game that I shot earlier this year harder to get expressions of players sometimes you get lucky and you can do it both these guys colliding and closing their eyes capturing the emotion of players not just during action but on a game-winning kick notice the player being mobbed by his teammates as they're all excited over the victory. Great emotional shot. Well, here's my daughter on the far right there. A group hug with her team as they won one of their playoff games. And then one of my favorite shots of Steve Jacobs' son as he hit a walk-off Grand Slam home run in Cooperstown, New York, home of the Baseball Hall of Fame, no less. Uh, Ryan is obviously Excited as he's traveling around the base pass. The guys uh, in the dugout look a little less excited, but fortunately they're somewhat out of focus at an f-stop of five. And then don't forget the cheerleaders and coaches and other people where you can capture emotion. Even shooting the losing team after someone hits a game-winning shot, like Michael Jordan did against my beloved Cleveland Cavaliers in 1989. A picture of Craig Elo falling to the floor in anguish is a wonderful shot, especially if you're a Bulls fan. All right, so to summarize, 10 tips for better sports photographs. Number one, fast shutter speeds. Number two, wide open apertures. And that combination is what allows you to get a decent exposure. You want to go as fast as you can with the shutter and as wide open as you can with the aperture. Tip number three is use your lowest ISO, ideally 100 to 800, but the reality is, especially with indoor sports, you're typically going to shoot at higher ISOs and you just sacrifice image quality for the sake of getting the frozen action that you want. Tip number four is to use a continuous shooting mode rather than single shot. Tip number five has to do with autofocus. You want to be continuous with your autofocus and dynamic where it will pick up different spots near the center of your image, but maybe not in the dead center of your image where you might miss it. Number six, shoot in JPEG format, or if you've got a super duper camera, you may want to shoot raw, but good luck if you do. There are lots of images to process after the fact. Number seven, choose good shooting locations, ideally at ground level or court level for your best shots and move around. Get a variety of different pictures. Number eight, frame your subject for best effect and leave some room ahead of a moving subject in your frame for aesthetic purposes. Number nine, know your sport and anticipate the action out there so you know where the play is going to be. If you know exactly where the play is going to be, you can pre-focus on that area and then switch over to manual focus what we called zone focus, so that you'll get the shot at that location.
And then finally, tip number 10, capture the emotions of players, which makes it all worthwhile when you get that great shot after the kid hits the winning home run or free throw or goal. Beautiful pictures. All right. Well, good luck with your sports photographs. I hope this has been helpful to you.